for different times of year for different animals. So I'm Clayton Morrison. Usually you'll have my mom or dad up here, but you guys got stuck with me today, so it'll be okay. Uh, we're in Penora, Iowa, so be about 45 minutes west of Moines. Uh, we have two, ac actually three Aki steel farms, a commodity shed and a 400 foot and a 320. Uh, we were on a custom reset by Rio operation out of ours. I'm Kyle Franzlubers, had a cow-calf barn put up in 2015. And Kavanaugh grew it 16 and walked two turns a year through it. I'm Travis again. Uh, I, uh, I do uh, Clayton's parents, Clayton's work um, on embryo as well as the pet dairy. Well, how do we want to start out this morning? Anybody have a question from the crowd? This is your guys' chance to ask the producers. Uh, we talked a lot about winter and summer. What's some of your guys' experience, maybe from the vet side or from the producer side? I had a question earlier at the booth was, well, how how do you keep all the snow out of the building? And I said, really, that's not our goal to keep it all out. But what's your guys' experience up there in Minnesota? You guys have maybe a little bit different weather than we do down here. What's your what's your experiences? Our weather's way worse than it is down here. Now, <laughs> we probably do get maybe more snow, and I don't know, it's windy everywhere, but. Um, we probably have more severe cold, but the cold hasn't bothered us really at all in the barn. Um, those really high winds and, and blizzards, we get a light dusting. I don't think we've ever had more than uh, uh, half an inch or just a light coating in the barn, but um, we did talk to Jason if there are things we can do with our bottom adjustment of our curtain to let some of that negative pressure or do things differently. but. We've had good luck, I don't know. Yeah, I would say the southeast wind has probably been the most troubling some, but we fixed that with putting the stock bales too high, over 200 feet away from the barn, so we're not limiting our airflow into our barn, but stopping some of that snow flow. But other than that, no issues. Yeah, so a lot of snow we get, uh, sometimes it comes with a little wind. We really haven't seen much snow in our barns. We've talked to Jason also to uh, maybe come up with a separate curtain that goes on top of the, the, the normal curtain, uh, just so we can drop that. Uh, so there's maybe not some snow that gets into our, our creek pens in the back. Uh, during summer, uh, it's awesome. It can be a still, humid day and there'll be just a little airflow through those barns somehow. You can step outside and there's none, but once you step inside those barns, there's designed to you know, keep the airflow going. Yeah, for the winter time, we don't see much of any snow getting into our barn. Uh, just kind of piles up around there, but that's manageable. And like I was saying, uh, during the summer, a calm day, We'll be bull breeding, it'll be 100 degrees outside, and the bulls will still be in the barn breeding cows. They're kind of unbothered by the heat. Any other questions? This is your guys' panel, so if you guys have something that you've uh, we haven't covered, or if you have other questions that um, from other topics, we can kind of drag in. You know, it's kind of wrapping up the. Symposium before the tour. If you guys have other questions from you, other other uh, presenters or uh, presentations, let us uh, let us know. So. Minimizing dust when you're betting. Have, have you guys? Uh, what what's your what's your thoughts on trying to keep the dust down when we're going in there and keeping eye problems and whatnot associated with the uh, with the betting? So when we bed, we'll feed beforehand. So all the cattle and some of the cows will be up at the bunk eating. So there's less animals back on the bed pack. And then as long as there's a south wind, we'll keep that curtain open and blow it back in there. But if there's a north wind, we'll have to shut the curtain. But as soon as we get done, we raise that curtain right back up and try to get as much dust out of there as you can. Yeah, so our bale process is a little bit different than a normal, it's a true let, so it's the feed wagon and bale press or bale processor all in one. So like if we get some really dry, dusty bales 
and we know we've got some wetter bales sitting around, we'll actually mix some of that wet bale in there to maybe collect some of the dust so when you blow it in there, you're not blowing you know, the dust over there. And we do feed, we feed right in the morning, so, and we'll bed right in the morning, and we'll actually bed you know, twice a day if we need to, if we're locking cows back or something like that. You know, once you push those cows back on that bed pack, you're, you know, you're putting the rest of the stuff in the ground while we just go back and bed again. But, I mean, like he said, there's a south wind, you know, you open that and that dust just goes right out. And as long as you have, you know, the, the ridge vents, that'll help get rid of a lot of the dust also. And then to have your east and west curtains open on the end of the door, that helps. Yeah, we, we always make sure, uh, like I said, our curtains almost always open, fully open year round. But for some reason, if it, it is weather that we've had it shut, we make sure we open it some and it helps clear it out. I do have a question for anybody up here or in the crowd. We've we've just started, uh, last year we did it. So when our cows start cycling in the barn, um, you know, we, we have, we AI so many cows and we have so many bull bred, but we have about a 60 day total uh, calving period. They get cycling so hard that we had to feed M MGA uh, to stop our cows from cycling because we didn't want to it was before we were going to AI. I don't know if anybody else has done that. It seemed to work fine, then we took them off, uh, we went through a veterinarian, took them off, I think, seven or ten days ahead of when they put the cedars in, or? Okay, I, I will have to recheck on that, but um, we just had too much ride. They cycled so hard, and we were getting too much riding, and, and you know, we did cause a couple injuries from that, so I don't know if you guys have run into that, or anybody in the crowd has used MGA to, to hold that cycling down. And it seemed like our, our breed up was good. I mean, so, and definitely the ones, we, we don't AI everything, the ones we turn off pasture, obviously they all cycle closer too. So I'm just looking for opinions. Yeah, we never, I guess we never have many hip problems or feet problems uh, because of riding, but we're, you know, all we do is embryos, we don't have any bulls, we don't AI or anything, so we set up so many cows and you know you, you can watch those cows so close, so if, if one does get you know a slight hip problem or something like that, we can pull it off as fast as we need to, but I mean, I don't, we've never seen any, any, uh, any hip or any riding problems by any means. Yeah, we haven't really seen much issues either. I will say the cows do seem to cycle a little bit quicker, a little bit easier in a barn than maybe out in the open. Yeah, just uh, reiterate that fact of Clayton's. I mean, we'll set up pins, pins of 18 to 20 at a time. I mean, it, it's like an episode of Girls Gone Mild there for a while. But uh, truthfully, I yeah, will have some injuries here and there. Nothing I wouldn't say is dramatic. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll have some feet issues here and there, but truthfully, nothing horrible. Um, I do get a little nervous just from the repro side of me running the MGA prior to a cedar. You do get some residual stuff, but I just, the, the longer they can get off of it, the better. But the minute you pull that MGA, you're going to have them come right back in, you know. You know as well as anybody who probably saw it, you know. You pull them off, and so then you got you got to weigh. You know, if you breed, or you do a bunch of volunteer waiting period, you waiting 45 or 60 days post calving before you're breeding or cedaring or however you're doing it. Yeah, pass the mic down. We're calving those cows. They're starting the first of, of uh, March, and then we're breeding the those the uh, about the t late May, 20 something of May. So. Yeah, it seemed like they came, they cycled quicker, harder, and we just didn't want, um, you know, it was our first time too, we just didn't, maybe we just didn't know how to handle the activity that much in there. So, it seemed to work fine, but yeah, we're, we're, we're looking for advice on, for sure, when to get that MGA out of there, or two weeks. We had a question out here about bedding. Since we're all in the cow-calf production up here, let's, I'm sorry, Travis, did you want to finish, did, 
finish that up? Okay. Um, we had a uh, question about bedding. So how often, how many bales, do you guys keep track of how many pounds per, per head? What's, uh, uh, Clayton, you mentioned that you, your family has the feed wagon that does the blowing also. Um, that's uh, kind of an interesting tool that, that's uh, kind of new on the scene. But uh, talk about your bedding program and, and how often you scrape. Just kind of give us a rundown of your scheduling on that. Okay, so we'll feed before anything. Um, usually because Traps is probably coming that day to put embryos in and he wants those cows, one of those cows full. Um, but when he's not coming, we'll, we'll feed in the morning, we'll bed right after that, um, and then we'll actually wait till probably the end of the day to scrape. Um, or if we, you know, if we got tours coming through, we'll, we'll scrape first thing before we do anything. But that way, those calves and cows just aren't slipping when they're trying to eat. You know, they're, they're all trying to push at the bunk, we know that. So if they have that maneuver on the ground, it gives them a little bit more traction, you know, you're not slipping a hip or spreading legs or anything like that. Uh, for bedding, we do about 2,400 pounds per barn. There's 150 cows in each barn. So I'm no math genius or anything. Um, somebody else can do that in mouth. Uh, and we do that in both of our barns. One's a little bit bigger than that. Uh, more square footage. So one of the barns is 48 or 46 and the other one's 60. So there's you know, 14 foot difference in there. So, so you said every day you do 2,400 pounds of bedding? For each barn. For each barn and you got 150 cows per barn? Right around. So you're running 16 pounds of bedding per day? Yeah. So about right then. Okay. Yeah. So, and that's the handy thing about our, our feed wagon and bale processor being all in one, we can track, you know, if, it, if it's less of a humid day, um, which never happens in Iowa, but for instance, less of a humid day, we don't have to bet as much. If it's a really humid day and we know those pens are going to get wet faster, you know, we'll bet a little bit more to maybe offset, you know, the timing just a little bit of how fast they get wet. Um, but if they, you know, if it's, uh, if it just rained a little bit, you know, we'll go bet that pretty heavy. But let's just say during the summer, it's still, it's not so humid. We might, you know, we might only do 1,200 pounds of barn and just go put a light drifting over it. Our kind of rule of thumb is if you can bend down and your knee gets wet, I mean, it's time to bed. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of what we do, I guess. What are some of the other programs up there? Yeah, we would bet every day as well. We bet at night because we feed at night, but we are closer to the 20, 28 pounds per day. And we would also figure about three bales per space per year, roughly four bedding. Not not feed, not including what we feed with the corn stalks to our cows. And we we bale we process two bales per day for sure, which is about 2,800 pounds per 100 cows. Any space, the pens that have pairs would get about a bale and a half, and the open or the red cows still would get about a half. We run those pounds a little bit rougher, I would say, than what, where our calves are. I'd say that too, not to pull you up, but our creek pens, you know, those pens probably get a little more, so when I say 2,400 pounds, you know, and one barn's full of calves and the other barn's just full of calves, so, you know, we probably do hit that, those creek pens where those calves are going to be staying just a little bit harder than, you know, the cow pens, uh, to say. What we do is we'll feed in the morning, run by bed really quick, use two bales, so it would be about 24 pounds per cow, cow calf unit. But when we're calving, we start calving in February, that we'll feed at night, bed at night heavy. So if they calve at night, they're calving in something dry. But then during the summertime, we might go two days before we bed again, just kind of bed pack management like I was saying if you can get down and your knees get wet, you should bed, but for us, farms on top of the hill, we get plenty of airflow through it so it keeps the top bedding dry so we'll, we can stretch it a little bit harder there. And then when we're back running our calves, we can unbed them once and it might last four or five days before it gets to that point. And then for cleaning the apron, during calving, we'll clean it two three times a week, not every single day, and then like now, 
we clean it probably once a week, every Monday morning after we get done with chores or after they get done eating, we'll go through and clean it. And that's more so just to save time because we're trying to haul corn, get ready for planting and whatnot. We had a question over here, and maybe I'll start with Travis. I'll let you kind of answer this to get started. You see a lot of different operations. We were asked kind of a functionality. What would be in your ideal world? What is the program from a macro level of when do we when do we breed? When do we when do we drop calves? If we do a single barn system, kind of what would be your ideal from a health standpoint? How would you set this system up if you're thinking about a first time getting into this? What's the from a high level, what's the best protocol to get started with? Well, that's that's an interesting question. Uh, I mentioned in my speech or talk or whatever, look at different places and think outside the box. We were just talking a little bit ago. Um, you know, you're going to have an investment in whatever facility type you get into. I'm more of a fan of utilizing that facility with maybe adding a fall hurt, maybe adding a summer hurt. But if you can cabin that thing almost year round and not having an AI program like some of my clients do where the bull's always in, but have a defined calving season and use that, um, I don't think time really matters. I mean, you take out a lot of the environmental issues that we deal with, the mud, the cold, um, the wet. Um, so I don't really have a really good answer for you as far as a 30,000 foot. Um, I'm more of a space utilization type guy and make that investment work for you. It's something I didn't talk about, but man, I really like the idea of calving several times a year, kind of like if you look at a dairy, going back to that example, or a sow barn. They aren't just pigging unless it's a batch farm. They're pigging all the time. Um, that's how you, you uh, help with cash flows and everything else. So. I, think, I think labor would speak into that too. We have a lot of customers that are trying to cap all out at once or in a short time window, and it becomes, a, you know, they honestly they end up sleeping in their uh, office or when they sleep in their house for that period of time. Um, go ahead now we got another comment but go ahead and tell us about kind of your macro level here's where we do this here's when we wean this is when we go back to pasture if we utilize that just kind of talk a little bit more about your 30,000 foot view so what we do is we run two groups we'll start calving in February and we'll calve in August uh, for us what we do is we calve we breed and we wean all in the barn that's kind of what we think are the three biggest things in a cow calf operation is you got to get those cows to calve you got to get them rebred, and then you got to wean them so they get ready for their next calf. We wean at 120 days. It's a little bit early, they're a little bit light, but we can get them on feed and get them bone broke and everything like that relatively easy. And we just multiply or we just copy that system in our uh, August fall group. And for us, the reason why we chose those months is we get done calving before we start planting, and then we get done calving before we start harvest. It's my opinion is you got to find the times that fits your operation the best. Is there any special, anything you do special with the cattle as you start to wean in that 120 days? Is it a tough process? Is there a little lighter? Is it, how does weaning go in the barns? Honestly, the calves stay in the barn. We just take the cows out and the calves ball for two or three days, but their intakes might drop for that first day and a half, but then they get right back up there and they're eating just as much as they would be if they weren't, because they've been in that comfortable environment where they're at. They don't have the heat stress, they don't have much stress at all. They're in a place where they already know. So I guess for us, we calve all year round. There's really no stopping point. So we came up kind of a system, kind of what we call the snake. So basically the north barn at our place, that is just the, the calving barn, basically. The first two pens, that's what we calve in. And then so we'll start there, and then there's usually you know 18, 18 to 20 cows in there. And then once those are all done, we'll push all the cows up. So the second pen goes in the first pen, and then just moves up. So by the time that pen eight in the the south barn, it will be empty basically. All the cows just basically move up. And then so then we start rebreeding all over again. So we all we're always running cows. They're always breeding, always implanting an embryo somewhere. So it, it helps. Like Travis said, use the space and cash for the things. We had a quick question here, Clayton. I'll let you be the first one to answer as we get to the next group. How many bulls do you have in your place right now? 
Zero. Zero pulls. Zero. <laughs> oh, yeah, Travis. Uh, yeah, him, right there. <laughs> he does the magic duty, so no, All right, we so don't run any. Give us just that quick 30,000 feet, kind of when you, uh, one group, two groups, when you do some certain major activities in the operation. Well, since we're just getting, figuring our way out, you might say that we probably want to go to that two, uh, two sets, a spring and a fall group, but for now, what we're going to do this year is we're going to cab our, our set out. Uh, half the cows will stay in the barn and then we'll wean them in there. So 50 pair, will, we'll do that 50 pair will go to grass and then we bought uh, two pens worth, you might say, of uh, yearling heifers that we're going to finish in those other two pens. They'll be out come December, and and these other calves will move out come December, and then we'll we'll fill back in with a with a hundred head of cows again, and just like we are right now. But our only concern with doing that, we think it's going to work good. We know we've fed some cattle in the barn already, and they feed really well. But we hate to bring in. We we kind of knew where we bought these heifers, but we hate to bring a source of cattle in if we're trying to keep our biosecurity on the cows as best we can. So. How many bulls do you have currently on your at your place for? Well, we don't have any either, but we lease our bulls, so we AI kind of everything we want to, and then we've gone to it's our second year. We just lease bulls for the 30, 60 days or whatever we want them, and then we send them home. So on a bulls per per cow ratio, or how do you one how do you cover that? One to one to twenty five to thirty. Because okay. we're kind of cleaning up. We we're trying to AI everything. Pass it down there. We have five bulls on the place. We run one bull per 20 head of cows, and that's because we're shooting to get our calving window as tight as we can to keep our calves as consistent as possible. I'll just add uh, to my earlier point you brought up a good one. You know, I'm a little reluctant to say cab this month, this month. It's going to be dependent on everybody's operation. Uh, my biggest thing is what I try to tell people is make your cows work for you and not you work for them. So if it's busy planting season or harvest season, Obviously, you don't want to be calving at that point in time or, or running things through, but the other option that we did mention or somebody did mention that uh, weaning calves back into that barn, it's a good source of, uh, well, keeping that barn full. Um, you got you to gotta have throughput to pay these things off, so just something else I'd add. A quick extension on that, Travis, is I got a question about what's your, uh, is AI more successful in the barn, less successful? Is there a percentage that you'd want to try to do? Uh, get the cows set up correctly. Is there what would you tell producers you got to get started with, or what you'd expect over time? Um, I've had both scenarios. I've AI several thousand cows in um, in these systems, uh, different type of barns. Um, it's going to go back to that herd management, um, nutrition, um, condition, feed stuff, all of that. You think about reproduction. Reproduction is a luxury. Uh, that cow doesn't need to get bred. She wants to get bred, but if she's not got the right um, feed stuff or the building blocks to take care of that calf, fit in that system, and then breed, uh, it's just not going to work. Uh, I went back to my slide. I had to find the right cow that fits your situation or your system. Uh, big cows don't typically work real well in these situations. The hardier, I'm not going to say western cattle, but we get a lot of those in different uh, scenarios. Those seem to work pretty well after you calm them down. Um, I don't AI, so I no point. A uh, quick question was for the group that did the February and August group. What what are some of the differences you're seeing? Is there is one working a little better than the other? Is there a cold in February issue or a heat in August? What's your what's your experience with that? I know my wife a lot likes the August calving a lot more than the February calving, <laughs> but we were calving right in the heart of that really cold spell we had in February, and I mean we had calves lose half years and whatnot, and there's other management issues we ran into. We tried to put heat lamps in there, creep berries to keep them warmer in those really really excessively cold nights. Seemed to help out a little bit, but pretty much it's pretty consistent across the board because you're taking out not all the heat but you're taking out the excessive heat in the august group and you're taking off the extreme wind chill in the cold i'd make a quick comment here just from my standpoint i think we all have struggled with labor at times 
I think that's going to be something we're going to continue to struggle with. One thing that these barns do, it's a much more predictable system. I know one thing that my employees like, when you have cattle under, under roof, you've got, you're not, it's, it's livestock, so you can't ever guarantee anything. But we all have a pretty good plan to go home at 530. Now, like I say, things go awry and we'll make that some nights, but the idea is you kind of know what your schedule is. So you got ball games, you got kids events, you got employees that have kids that have things to do. It's not the wild, wild west. When you put things under the roof, you've got a much better chance to, like Travis said, you know, have the cows working for you. So, um, guys that had calved outside on pasture, what was the biggest thing you learned going into the barn? Travis, you got experience with that too, or whoever wants to answer, it's, it's fine. Uh, have a good catch pin or a good bumper. Um, that was always their pasture. The ranch hand works well to tie them off. Um, going into the barn, uh, I'll go back to my last comment, really calms them down. Like you can tell. I mean, we got stories, all kinds of stories, uh, Western cattle coming in, but within weeks to a month, you can go up and put your hand on most of these cows. Now, I'm not saying that they're not a little, uh, uh, nicely say that, after calving, they, you can still get those girls, but uh, it changes the ball game. I think everyone here would agree with me. Uh, I'll just pass them on. I'll let you guys, you're the ones that are doing it, and I'm just getting called out and pulling <laughs> So we haven't calved in any pastures, I guess. We just calved in dry last night kicked them out in the pasture when the grass is ready, but like Travis was saying, we have cows that we can walk up to, scratch them on the head and they just had a calf. We've had cows that the calf's having an issue sucking, you can go stand up right next to the cow, just stand in there and help the calf suck. It's really calmed all of our cows down quite a bit. Even the real flighty cows that are like, you walk in the pen, they just like, I take offense of you breathing. But, for the most part, it tames them down pretty good and it makes it relatively easy. Yeah, I guess we've never capped on pasture. It's always been on the barns. Um, like Travis said, we get, you know, we're always getting cattle in. You know, whatever doesn't take an embryo after so many times, we, you know, they're going to go to the sale barn because they're not really making us money, so there's no reason for them to be there. So we'll get you know, new ones in all the time, new loads in. And we only get from two places. This goes back to um, you knew where your cattle were coming from. Uh, we have one place out of South Dakota, one place out of Lakeside, Nebraska. Those are the only two places we get cattle. So, one, we know what we're getting every time. They're not going to send a junk one to us. And two, um, they're quarantined before they even get to our place. Then once they get, once they get to our place, they're quarantined for 30 days. Um, but I mean, they're in those barns for you know a month. And there's still there's still some that you know want to eat you when you walk in there, but. Um, for the most part, you'll be able to walk out without them after a month. Uh, us too, we, we kept in more big dirt lots, and I guess the one thing we had to learn right away is that our cows are easy to handle anyway, but we, as soon as they calf or within a short period of time, we get them mothered up in one of these, we have different pens to put them in for 12 to 18 hours or so, and then, but you have to get those out because, um, Otherwise, those newborn calves are just nursing a lot of other uncalved cows, and I mean they'll they'll steal that colostrum <coughs> like crazy. So you you have to you have to get that done. But then once they're into the pen with the other mates that are born within days, I mean it's it's a smoking sport, and it, they really do. The only thing I guess my said you know it's hard to evaluate a really poor milking cow sometimes because they're they're trading you know trading it back and forth. You just have to do it. A good job of monitoring. Yeah, I would say moving to the barn, it, it was a lot easier cabin, I think. You know, you're not in knee deep mud in a dry lot or anything else or wet snow. You, you know, I don't know who was talking about push a little bit of snow and you could feed and do everything. Whereas before it was, we were moving snow across the whole pond to get them water and everything else. That it goes back to that predictability. We had a question out here about uh, calls. How do you, what's your protocols for, for uh, calling animals? And then what, how do you reintroduce when you get new cattle in to, yeah, what's the protocol to introduce them into your herd? And what kind of genetics? I know we have Travis talk a little bit about what he thinks is the, is, is his ideal cow coming in for, for cost and whatnot. But what is your, what's your protocol for when you decide to, to, to let her go? What do you guys buying back? 
and how are you introducing that into your groups? Uh, so Cole's, a lot of our calling decisions are based on if she's bred or not, you know, your typical fall time, and then any attitudes or anything like that. We'll finish all of our calls after we wean, we'll put them on feed, and then go that route is how we manage. Will you, get, will you give them another chance in the next cycle, or do you give them one and done? No, we run very tight. I mean, it's with our bulls, once we, we yeah, and then we'll give them 42 days, and if she's not bred, then they're done. And then we early, we'll early preg check at, usually we'll try and be 45 days after we pull bulls, and we'll, we'll ultrasound or have our vet come out and ultrasound, and if she's open, then she'll go right to the fat pen, and we'll start putting her on feed. And then for bringing cattle back in, we raise all our own replacement heifers, and we have all red or red white face. We've pretty much gotten rid of all of our purebred red Angus. They all either been crossed with a limb flex or sim flex or a something or another or a herfer that we want all that heterosis that we can get on the cows. And we've we've really seen our health get better since we've done that, and our issue calf performance overall. The one thing I'd say is uh, we recently purchased a scale for under our chute, and that's an eye-opening experience on maybe what our cows really weigh. They, uh, our cows are too big, or, or certainly a lot of them, so we're going to slowly trim that down, but um, our cows would be 15 and a half, you know, at, at least, and we thought they were lighter. It's kind of like thinking what yourself weighs, and then when you get on the scale, it's generally more but so we, you know, we'd like to have a little lighter cow, but we, we've been happy with the performance. But they certainly eat a lot, and we want to be able to smell them. So our cows basically have a chance to take an embryo three times for their they're sent outside to the outside lot, and that's kind of what we call our coal pen. Uh, a lot of people are like, "Well, will they breed back?" Yes, there's nothing wrong with them. They just they won't take an embryo. You know, everyone knows it's, it's pretty hard to take an embryo. It's a you know small slim chance. So. Uh, we'll let that pen get filled up till about, I don't know, 8 to 10, we'll take those of sale uh, Another way is, you know, if our cows are, you know, getting old, getting skinnier, um, it, sometimes it's just, you know, this calf's sucking down so hard, and then they're hard to get back up, um, we'll, we'll go ahead and get rid of those. Uh, we, we get all of our cows from South Dakota, and then here out in Nebraska, all black Angus, and then red Angus, Hereford Crosses. Um, I'd have to say, if you're looking for the perfect cow, in these barns you're looking for bunk space is what it comes down to, so a smaller, you know, not smaller, but, you know, a smaller, moderate cow, that's not going to take so much bunk space, and then she doesn't take up so much square footage, then you could, you know, possibly put more cattle in the barn. Um, and then whenever those cows come to our place, uh, we ran all um, medicated systems in our water, so we can medicate all, you know, each pen by itself, each outside pen by itself. Uh, so they get stuck outside for 30 days, and then for a week they get, um, they go on oxytentin just to clear anything up, and that way we're not spreading anything. And they don't, they don't enter the barn until, you know, they're they're over that 30 days, and we know there's, you know, they're, they're cleaned up basically. So our cleaning process is, if a cow comes up open in our spring herd. We'll kick her back to her fall herd, give her a second option there, and if she's not bred then, she gets on the trail and goes to the sale barn. Otherwise, a big portion of it is condition. If you have a cow in a poor body condition, so she's not going to breed anyway, so she just gives, goes on the trailer with them. And then, for when we get cattle in, we'll put them in a dry lot outside the barn, kind of further away from the barn as we can get and she'll stay in there for two weeks, three weeks, whatnot, and then we'll introduce her to the herd, go put them up, or up in the barn, because we usually buy them right before they start calving. Feet, legs, um, size, um, and then breedability if she's up front or she way in the back. Um, I have run into a lot of these systems where they go from the spring herd, and they ultrasound them open, and then they move to the summer, and they ultrasound them open, and then they move to the fall, and, I like her. I'm gonna, I'm gonna move her back, and those cows just cost you money. The, I think the biggest one I had was six years. Is what that one went through that system. That never, it was a clubby donor, and then that was funny just because I remember that. It's six years she'd been open, yeah, of course. But 
again, making your cows uh, work for you. One thing I like that they mentioned, um, ultrasound. I love ultrasound. I do it all the time, and I highly suggest uh, back to predictability, especially on the cow-calf side. Why not ultrasound and have your vet do that and then move your cows and stage them? And that's the beauty of this stuff, especially if you're putting pins in. The predictability that you should calve in first two weeks of May, you should calve it. I mean, it's not going to exact science. I'll be the first one to admit. Um, but you should calve the following two weeks. So this, that way you're not running out in the middle of the night checking all 18 pins. You're just checking the five pins. But again, it goes back to making your cows work for you. We had a facilities question about equipment. In the barn, out of the barn, hydraulic, manual. What's your, what's, what are you using? What would you like to go to? What, what's your, now that you've got barns, and I, I've got one too, and as soon as we got it done, there's a whole bunch of things you'd want to change, but talk about uh, some of how you handle the cattle and uh, what kind of equipment they're running. How we kind of constructed our barn, I guess, is just had that front alleyway, and we installed gates in the back of the barn to help with mainly just cleaning out the barn. And when we cleaned off the barn, we used a regular front end loader tractor the first year. And that was horrible. That was god awful. Pretty much destroyed the loader on it. We had to go through and re weld everything on it. That a payloader was a great investment for us that we knew right away that it's like, yeah, that's something we're going to need for just manure handling side and whatnot. And we also first got the barn, we just had a side discharge bale processor within the first 30 days we knew that wasn't going to work so we had to go and we bought a bale processor with a spout on it which that made bedding 10 times better and pretty much just trying to figure out what machinery is going to work best for you like you guys with the processor and the feed wagon one that's a great option but also you got to realize sometimes what you have is what you have and you got to make it work as well we got an old skid loader that she works good to clean the apron off, and that's about it. We'd like to upgrade and stuff, but sometimes it just, you can't. So I guess how I change our barns, the design, not really so much the design, just the, uh, mostly concrete, and then um, I'd use well pipe uh, for everything. I would not do continuous fence ever again, because people love hitting gates, and nothing pisses me off more. Uh, and then I would go uh, kind of, you know, from the water back, I go, uh, I put like a three, three foot riser of concrete right there uh, because also people love to press up against when you're uh, cleaning the manure out um, and that also breaks gates. Um, and I guess I'd probably put more calving pens in if it was me. Um, just because we've had, you know, we brought a, a group of 200 bread heifers in, they were gonna calve in 30 days. Well, you do the math, that's a lot of calves in 30 days, and we ended up having to build, you know, just out of panels in the first pen, which made it hard, you know, it was never clean. I mean, it, it just made it hard. Um, for equipment-wise, uh, we use three pieces of equipment, uh, track skid loader, our bale processor and feed wagon, and then our old uh, 4450, which we'll never get rid of because it starts when it's negative 20. Um, I guess handling the cattle. Uh, I guess we use the butt box instead of a, a tub, uh, and that's, um, I guess it's less stress on the calves. You run them in, and they're thinking they're going out the same way, and they just run right up the, you know, right up the, the alleyway. Um, I go hydraulic, knowing that we we're going to run this many cattle through at once, um, and I think Travis can agree on that uh, because sometimes I mean, we just got a hydraulic. It's just a, I think it's a sue, but it's just a hydraulic arm is basically what it is. But sometimes that doesn't catch; it'll pop out, and then Travis is in there like scare me just a little bit too. And you've got a cow coming back at you, but I guess that's really all I've changed about it. And your facilities are inside your barns? Yes, yeah, so the 400 foot barn, 80 foot of it is uh, the cattle facility and the working facility, and the rest is eight pens of cattle.
Yeah, I, I would really highly suggest too, if you're looking at building a barn to, to really, you want to go look at a lot of systems, go there and um, and then ask the guys what they will and won't change. I mean, we, we tweak a couple of things different, but we, we try to do a lot of research. But, uh, and then there too, you're trying to save money on different things. We put, we put 64 feet, the barns of ours is 50 wide, then we took two bays, 60, yeah. 32 feet, 32 foot uh, for our working facility on the end. And we're really glad we did that, have it inside and we use a bud box too. It's you either your loadout alley or it doubles as a bud box coming through. And then we, we move that out during calving, that alleyway and shoot. We have it on wheels and it works really good. We take it out and then we have a calving pen and different nurse pens there too. But um, I'll let Madam go through a few other things, but I just really go around and, and look at some some other barns before you put one up. We spent five years before we ever even thought about building our first barn. And I'll be honest, Aki still, we really didn't know about them until, you know, year number four of, you know, doing our research in these things. Um, so, I mean, just take the time, go. I mean, we, we always say, you know, come take a tour. We're fine with it. We have some buyer security deals you gotta work through, but you know, take the time, go look, and even if you can get there or ask the person you're going to tour if they're going to be working cattle that day, don't be in the way, but just see how their facilities flow, because then you have an idea of what you want. Yeah, we we run an air equipped shoot for ours. And so, um, so one, that's the main thing is just what do you want to do with it? If you're just running cow calf. You probably want a different shoot than if you're doing a feedlot in the background and there's different neck extenders and everything else. We, us doing all of it, we've struggled kind of to figure out what the best one is and we're still working on it. And probably we'll just end up manufacturing something ourselves to fit all three needs using ideas from different manufacturers. But uh, the bud box, for, bud box for sure. I mean, safer, easier, all of the above. I had, uh, oh, go ahead. Our working facilities are outside, but I would say if I would ever redo the barn, I would add calving pens and maternity pens and at least one of the 16 foot bays there, just because you never know you have a set of twins, you have a calf that's lagging a little bit behind and whatnot, instead of having to make shift pens out of just panels, you have something concrete there, and you have something that you can really work with and really utilize that space got a favorite question of mine we're getting uh, of course a little cooler today but i don't think cold enough to kill the flies what are you guys doing for fly control what uh anything um and uh how effective have you found that we'll go around and we'll spray just a generic insecticide around the barn and try to stay on top of that that's about all we do and try to keep it as dry as possible to get water to get away from the barn so it's not cooling up around the water. Yeah, so we use Soother Feeds in, out of Frankfort, Kansas, and they put a uh, fly, I don't say repellent, but in the mineral, uh, and then we go around with a grenade outside, outside the barn in front of the bunk, and then uh, when the cows are beaten, we'll actually go inside uh, the back wall and spray them there uh, just to you know, kill whatever's back in the creek then. Yeah, so we're going to try something new in our mineral this year. We're actually going to use garlic to help with that. And then we use premise sprays on animals, spray, treat the bed pack. I mean, one main thing is cleaning up any extra feed laying around, any manure stockpile. We try and get it as far away from the cattle or anything as possible because that's where the breeding ground is. So you mentioned manure quick there. What's your, what's your guys' plans on? Do you guys stockpile inside a barn? Do you stockpile outside? Do you go right to the field? Do you have some hay ground? We had a question earlier about manure management. So just maybe get a little deeper in the weeds on what do you, what happens after you scrape that pin. So we clean once a week minimum, and then we have a, a, a pad of cement on the end of the barn where we push it. We can hold, you might say, two weeks worth there, two weeks worth of cleaning. But, but we try, like, the winter, We'll haul out, I mean, all the time. And then our summer clean out, 
we'll stockpile by a field where we're going to spread it. But I would highly, there too, that's where we're going to look at barns. <clears throat> Nobody talked to us really about that area on the end, and I don't know who talked us into it on the end, but if we would have had that, I, I don't know, we would have jumped off the roof, right? I mean, that, is that covered then, or is that no, open? It's no, just open. It's, it's just open, but we want to make that, it's 20 feet, and, and you can get by with that, but, you know, and always more, but another even 10 feet, but just, just for having that room to be cleaning and loading and whatever, just for the short term, that, that is a must, to have some cement on the, on the end. And, um, but otherwise, yeah, then we, we clean our barn only twice a year, or that's what we've done to this point, but we probably will try and do three uh, as far as the bed pack in the future. To go back to flight control, um, bedding would be another big thing uh, if you want to try to keep the flies down. Uh, you know, flies love manure, so this, you know if you got a lot of manure exposing, there's gonna be a lot of flies in there. But if you keep that bed pack pretty well, you know, covered up, you know, you don't gotta go put down six inches of you know new stocks. But if you just keep that, you know, that nice fresh layer over, that'll help the flies. Uh, we scrape every day, and then we clean two pens a week. So. What is it? Each panel get cleaned every two months. I think it's what it equals out to, or something like that. I can't remember. But and then we trade all of our manure for uh, stock bales for ton for ton. Uh, we don't really have. We only got 40 acres, and <laughs> that's mostly silage, and you can't get corn stalks from silage. So we actually trade all of our manure for ton for ton for corn stalks. Uh, and we have stockpiled during the winter uh, and during the summer. And, they come and haul it off, I guess. We'll scrape the apron two, three times a week during calving once a week when it's not calving season. And we'll stockpile that at the end. We have a manure bay at the end of the barn as well. We got enough space for roughly two months. And then once when we have time, we'll go in and clean that out and go stockpile it out in the field. For the bed pack, we clean that out twice a year, once before each group we start calving. And we just haul it out and stockpile it, or if we can, we go out and spread it right in the field. I've got a quick comment on that from a builder standpoint. And I'm not, doesn't matter what kind of building you build. I do not like the manure bays inside the barn. I like them on the ends. You're building a barn that's specific to feed cattle and it's got specific airflow, it's specifically designed for cattle. Don't pile manure where you should have cattle. Get that on the ends of the barns. Put it on a separate building if you want it under roof to try to keep it as dry as possible, but don't take up bays inside the building with manure. It, I know it's handy, but it takes up a lot of expensive real estate. So. Anybody have any other questions for the group? Oh, right over there. I think we're getting things close to wrapping up here, so. Might get the lucky last question. You can ask me. I guess I was curious. Time time commitment wise per day. Um, one of you sound like you do har you know planting, harvest, row crop, and stuff. At what's your average time commitment per per day, especially in some of those busier seasons with your other enterprises? Usually, we'll spend about an hour and a half to two hours in the morning with feeding, bedding, and walking the pens. And if we have to treat or pull something, it'll take another half hour or whatnot. And then about another hour or so, 45 minutes in the evening, just feeding when we're trying to harvest and we're trying to plant and whatnot. Because that's why we calve so early, so we're not busy with the cattle while we're doing those other enterprises, I guess. Yeah, so besides, we've got JBS pigs. But besides those, uh, there's somebody, since we cab all year round, um, there's someone there all day, every day. You know, there might be different people there. But there's only you know, three people, full-time people that work at our place. So when we've got one uh, part-time guy that just fe helps feed, basically, and he cleans a pen once in a while. Um, but there's... How many cattle is that over then, Clayton? Uh, five, 550. 550 cows, and you got three and a half. Yeah, well, full-time employees. Yeah. Okay. And then, you know, so there's always somebody out there, but I mean, you've got two hours of feeding and bedding, and then you've got, you know, during the day, you'd be 
treating sick cattle or something like that. I think there's always something you could be improving. Now that's all we do. If we have a farm and stuff like that on the side, yeah, we'd have to split up our time, you know, a lot more equally. But since that's all we do, you know, there's always cleaning to be done. There's always, you know, clean pans or doing something like that. I don't know if we have an exact time frame, but I do know this, it would cut our, our work for the exact number of cattle, you know, what we've had before. It, I don't know if I can say it cut it in half. I mean, it, it cut it a tremendous amount. The other thing, when you're feeding and doing stuff, even from the outside, because the barns are not that wide, you can, you get a good visual look, right? You can see to the back of the barn. I mean, we go in there, but it, it's, it seems like it's easy to evaluate if somebody isn't feeling good or something isn't doesn't look right, um, but I think it's, it's just tripping our workload tremendously um, since before we had the barn. You're thinking about two hours a day is what you're spending with the, with the cattle, not, not in calving season. And you've got how many cows? 150. 150 cows. So one last question here. What, I'm curious uh, what you're using for rations. Uh, are they nutrient dense so that you don't have to feed so much, so you don't have large amounts of manure uh, to deal with, uh, with high refuge diets compared to that? Is there some secrets that you found on the best thing to use for that so that you can get around those manure management issues? Yeah, I mean, the main key that we do is cheap. It just has to be cheap. But, so our ration wouldn't be dense, it's a lot of corn stalks, and then a byproduct. So that, I guess, the way I look at it, is it cheaper to haul the manure out or to feed the cattle cheaper and have more manure? You know, there's a trade-off there where your ration price, I don't know, if, does that kind of answer what? It, it, it varies from year to year, too, on the price of everything, you know, obviously with, with all, um, some years we have more corn silage or we're gonna have some rye silage this spring. We'll implement different feed stuffs, but uh, it gives you more options, I would say that. Yeah, I'd say ours is more dense. Um, all we really feed is corn stalks, distillers, uh, any kind of silage we got, and then a liquid mineral. Uh, and yeah, I guess we'd rather just feed the cattle, you know, to produce what that cattle needs, then you know, just slim by just a little bit. Um, and we've been told maybe ours is a little more expensive per head per day, but you know we'd rather have that cow in good working condition than playing catch up all the time. We feed a little bit more higher roughage ration, and that's because we feel like if the cow's a little more timid or something like that, it's not aggressive as the bunk, it allows it still time to get what it needs to have in it compared to a boss cow trying to push around and still got to eat the, the pounds a day. And then for the manure side, we got the ground to spread the manure, so if we have a little extra manure, that's not bad either. One, one last question I'll ask is, anybody wants to share, you don't have to, but what would be your cow carrying cost per day for, for feed? How much does it cost you to feed a cow on the roof a day? Does anybody have a number that you want to share? On our heavy lactation, when we're feeding, it's going to cost us around $1.60 under barn. Yeah, I'd say lactating, we're more around that dollar eighty uh, number, I guess. Um, and obviously that'll drop, not dramatically, but it'll drop slow uh, when they're a dry cow, I guess. I would say I was just close to probably two dollars. I don't know, just feed costs, depending on what you're figuring on. Two dollars a day just for the feed, though, not putting the barn or anything, just, just the cost, carrying cost for the cow per day is about yeah, probably a little less than if you take out. We try and, there too, I mean, you have to, you, it's a slippery slope adding all your yardage and things into a figure to make sure you're getting your payment worked out there, but probably a little under two. Sounds good. I think that'll wrap up our producer panel. We give these folks a hand for getting up there.